We all know of oxygen as a free element in the atmosphere, as a constituent of vegetation and of all living things. It is combined in water and in most of the rocks of the earth. And we understand the part which it plays in burning. But all this is recent knowledge. In the early days of alchemy, there were no clear scientific ideas, but a belief or hope that base metals could be transmuted into gold lay behind most of the work. Alchemists found that lead gave a yellow ash, and they carried out countless experiments in their attempts to make a golden one, real gold in fact. They obtained many new substances, but the old belief in transmutation stood in the way of new ideas until the 17th century. Then came a new theory. In 1669, Johann Becher, a German chemist, with Stahl, his pupil, published an important book, Physicae Subterraneae, which described the phlogiston theory. They regarded burning as a decomposition into ash and a mysterious element, phlogiston, which escaped. Flames were not phlogiston, but only evidence of its passage to the air. Ash remained when all phlogiston had gone. Substances which burned were said to be rich in phlogiston. Others, such as metals, which do not ready catch fire, but which produce much ash or calx, were said to be poor in phlogiston. Carbon was thought to be almost pure phlogiston, since it burns away and leaves little ash. The ash or calx of lead was regarded as the metal from which all phlogiston had escaped. Carbon and lead calx together, therefore, should produce the metal. This deduction from theory could be put to the test of experiment. At first, there is little change beyond a darkening in colour. But after prolonged heating, the metal is produced. Another example, a burning candle releases phlogiston, which soon saturates the air in a bell jar. And so the flame goes out. The theory explained many observations and was accepted for 150 years. But there were difficulties. A metal changing to calx gains weight, though it has lost phlogiston. So phlogiston was supposed to have negative weight. But other work was also undermining the theory. Methods of handling gases were being developed. At first, collection was in bladders. Then a delivery tube was used to collect them over water in a pneumatic trough. Later, for precise experiments, water was replaced by mercury to prevent soluble gases from dissolving. Methods of transference to other vessels for testing were now well known. Gases were no longer ignored and the stage was set for new discoveries. Shaler, a Swedish apothecary, was the first
to isolate the gas which we now call oxygen. But an English Unitarian minister, Priestley, discovered it independently in 1774. His discovery was almost accidental. He had been given a large burning glass. And he used it to heat all kinds of substances. But a hot summer's day does not make for very clear thinking. And in one experiment, Priestley used the red calx of mercury, a substance from which phlogiston had already been driven by heating. According to the phlogiston theory, further heating could hardly be expected to have any effect. But Priestley did heat the calx in a small volume of air in the bell jar. He was amazed to see the calx disappear, releasing a film of mercury on the glass and producing a gas. But more surprises were in store. Priestley produced a larger supply of the gas and confined a mouse in it. The mouse was, if anything, more frisky than before. A flame continued to burn, even more brightly than in air. Priestley called the gas dephlogisticated air, but he had prepared the way for a new theory. In the latter part of the 18th century, a great French chemist, Antoine Laurent Lavoisier, formulated the theory which we still accept. He had become convinced that gas from air joined with metal to form calx. But he had so far failed to recover this gas. Priestley's discovery gave him the clue. Maboisier proceeded to experiment with mercury and finally demonstrated his new theory. He poured exactly four ounces of mercury into a long-necked flask or retort. He placed the retort in position, isolating the neck in air confined in a bell jar. The liquid level was adjusted so as to leave exactly 50 cubic inches of air. The marker was stuck in position. Atmospheric temperature and pressure were noted. Then the furnace was lighted. For a whole day, there was no change in the retort. But on the second day, there had appeared on the surface of the mercury a few red spots. As the days passed, they grew in size and number until the whole surface was covered. In the bell jar, the liquid, which had been forced down by expanded air, had now risen. Gas was disappearing. Heating was continued for a further seven days to ensure that the action was complete, and then the apparatus was left to cool. By measurement and calculation, Lavoisier found that eight cubic inches of gas, weighing some three and a half grains, had disappeared. And, to his satisfaction, the mercury and calx showed a gain of exactly three and a half grains. Tests on the remaining gas showed that it had lost its active part and would no longer support combustion or life. Lavoisier argued that mercury had taken an active gas from the air, 
to produce kelp. The mercury gained three and a half grains. Air lost three and a half grains. But as Priestley had found, calx heated alone produces an active gas and mercury. Will the calx from the first experiment lose three and a half grains? And will the air gain three and a half grains? Lavoisier proceeded to find out. He took the mercury and calx from his first experiment. When the calx had floated to the surface, he scraped it aside. Now let's just watch. And now the apparatus was arranged as before. But this time the liquid level was siphoned to a rather higher level in the bell jar. In the retort, a grey mist soon formed, as in Priestley's burning glass experiment. Drops of mercury ran together down the hot glass. Slowly all the calcs disappeared. And yes, in the bell jar the volume of gas had increased. Measurements show that eight cubic inches, three and a half grains, had appeared. and the gas was active, supporting combustion readily. It now remained to find the weight of mercury, which the heated calx had released and which had been freed from the sides of the retort. It was found to weigh less than the original calx, just three and a half grains less. Lavoisier was convinced that his explanation was correct and that all calcination and combustion was combination with an active gas of the air. He found that the gases produced in all common combustion were sour or acid. And so from two Greek roots, oxyu, gen, meaning sour, I produce, he devised a new name for the gas, oxygen. <laughs>